Given your position as the head of Human Rights Watch, do you have a sense of the way Australia's reputation is seen in humanitarian matters? You know, frankly, these days when people think about Australia's human rights policy, they think foremost about Manus and Nauru. Mm. And it's very difficult to have, you know, such a gaping scar on your record not overshadow everything else. In many ways, it's like, you know, Guantanamo for the United States. I'm interested to know what you think Australia should be doing or could be doing. I mean, our offshore resettlement scheme is pretty good. Um, but what should we be doing in relation to boat people? Yeah, well, I mean, frankly, I think Australia's policy with respect to the boat people is absolutely despicable. If you really were concerned about stopping the boats at sea, you would, you know, invest the millions that are being wasted in Manus and Nauru, you would invest it in places like Indonesia or Malaysia so that, you know, people who wanted to be resettled in an orderly way would have a decent life while they waited. You know, so there would be schools there, there would be health care, there would possibly be jobs. Um, and it, that you know, is, would be money so much better spent. And it would be money spent in a way that was rights respecting rather than one that just treats people as pawns. To the point that you know, Australia's even rejected resettlement offers from New Zealand because New Zealand's too nice a place to go. You know, Australia well, wants these people to suffer. The public explanation is because it would be a backdoor into Australia. I'm sure that, you know, the Afghans and the Iraqis and the Syrians would be perfectly happy in New Zealand. Yes. You know, and, and that's the problem, because Australia doesn't want there to be a happy ending for the people in Madison Nauru. They want them to be, you know, miserable as an object lesson to other would-be boat people. But th this just should not be passed off as a humanitarian policy. You know, it is utterly inhumane to the people stuck in Madison Nauru. This is really about just keeping these Muslims away. Mm. Um, and they try to dress it up with humanitarianism because nobody likes to be an overt Islamophobe, but everybody sees what's really going on. There seems to be an, an element of Islamophobia which certainly seems to have oh. sprung yep. up in Europe. Yeah, Islamophobia is a big part. There clearly is a reaction against the refugees and against migration overall. And I think it's driven really by three kinds of insecurity at this stage. You know, one is economic insecurity by people who feel left behind by the global economy, and they're just looking for an easy scapegoat. You know, it's, it's hard to blame free trade, it's hard to blame technology, so blame the refugees, you know. Yes, like they used to blame the Jews. <laughs> yes, exactly, it's a very similar idea. You know, part of it is um, security. You know, there is a terrorist threat. And even though a minuscule number of the refugees are involved in, in terrorism, the bulk of the terrorists are second or third generation migrants. And nonetheless, people are saying, well, you know, maybe these people are terrorists, but what do we do in 20, 30, 40 years? You know, and if you don't do a better job of integrating them, you may well have a security problem, but there's an answer, which is better integration. Mm. But then I think maybe the driving force is cultural and the sense that you know, these people are not like us. And that's where the Islamophobia comes in. They say, these people don't really want to integrate. They don't want to acculturate. They're trying to stay different. And these are all just ways of saying, we don't want Muslims here. To what extent do you think that's a result of the fact that 9-11 was Muslim terrorists? I mean, right after 9-11, what was interesting, there was a very deliberate effort, even by George W. Bush, to distinguish the terrorists from the Muslim religion. Mm. Uh, and indeed, the, the kind of Islamophobia that today you see being espoused by people like Marine Le Pen or, or Nicolas Sarkozy in, in Europe could or, have been... Or Pauline Hanson in Australia. Or, or Pauline Hanson. <laughs> I mean, basically, it could have been written in Raqqa. You know, if, if you are an ISIS recruiter sitting in Raqqa in northern Syria, figuring out how do I develop recruits in Sydney or in Paris, you know, or in New York, I want to promote Islamophobia. I want these people to be completely demonized, isolated, marginalized, feel that they have no future in their country. Now, most of them are still going to just grin and bear it, but some are going to be some, become so angry and disillusioned that these are the people who can be recruited into terrorism. Mm. And so the smart counterterrorism policy avoids that kind of Islamophobia. But of course, the demagogues behind it are not actually interested in safety. There are people who are scared and there are people who are receptive to this anti-Muslim message. The demagogues convey it, not because it makes us safer, because it, it scores them points, it, 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 it tracks votes. How do, we, how do we, in a practical sense, oppose uh, Islamophobia and all that follows from Islamophobia? I mean, I think part of the answer, a big part of the answer is personifying the people who arrive. 
you know, one making clear that these are, you know, families fleeing ISIS, fleeing Assad's barrel bombs. You know, these are ordinary people, often quite well educated, who just want to save their lives. And, and the more people see those individuals, the more they, they tend to sympathize. It is much easier to be Islamophobic against an abstraction, this, you know, Muslim horde. Um, when you talk about individuals, people often respond with, with humanity. So I think that's a big part of it. But also, you know, try to introduce facts with respect to how Muslims are, are already integrating into the community. This is obviously not the first wave of Muslims to Australia. How have others done? You know, what are contributions that they're making? What are businesses that they've mounted? Um, I think that all helps. Um, but I think that, you know, to try to move past the cheap emotion and bring it back to the reality of what's at stake here and what can be done to manage it in a way that, that meets Australia's legitimate national needs, but doesn't completely undermine the rights of people who are desperately fleeing persecution.